I mean, there's there's a lot of other stuff. I so <laughs> learned how to make a pillow out of toilet paper. I was in jail. That was good. <laughs> it's a very useful <laughs> skill. <laughs> I'm rolling as soon as you want to kick it off, Joe. All right. Welcome to Fretboard TV, episode 11. Cranking these out. I think this is my third episode, but Joe Sierra, CEO, of Fretboard. Nice to meet you all again. Accompanied here by the gnarly gnome. Would you say we're cranking it up to 11? Yes. I stole we, your joke. We, that's all right. <laughs> Very good. Definitely cranking it up to 11. Finally, we can use the Spinal Tap record. So. Uh, joined here by Gnarly Gnome, a notorious Cincinnati beer blogger. We're very excited to have you here. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for your time. Why don't you give us a little bit of background? Are you born and raised in Cincy? How, how did the gnome become the gnome? It's a, there's a bit of a, a story there. So kind of, you know, sort of raised in Cincinnati. I you know, was born... Uh, West Virginia, spent some time there, spent some time in North Carolina, and then, so for the most part though, just been here, just doing the Cincinnati thing. All right, all right. <laughs> but as far as the gnome, that's a much, well, it's an easier story to tell, I guess. When I was in college, for some god unknown reason, my wife, or my, uh, my, my mom bought a gnome for my apartment. Once I met my wife, we moved the gnome into the house, and then people started seeing the gnome, and they said, oh, you, you collect gnomes. And well, I mean, not really, but uh, you know, okay, and they buy me a gnome, and then another one would show up, and another one, and pretty soon they just started kind of multiplying. They ended up on the top of our cabinets in our kitchen of this little townhouse we were renting together, and um, just all these gnomes. Fast forward, we buy a house. My wife decides that the gnomes needed to go. She sent them down to the basement, which at the time was just an unfinished basement. Sent them down there, and there's these gnomes that just live in the basement for a few years. Start building my bar in the basement eventually, because that's what you do with the basement, you build a bar. The bar needed a name, and I'm sitting there at the bar with a beer, and I'm trying to like, what do you name a bar? Like, how do you create a personality for a bar? And I'm looking around, there's the gnomes just staring at me. I'm like, oh. It's the Gnarly Gnome Tavern. So <laughs> that, that came about then. And then fast forward a couple of years, the blog starts and um, the Gnarly Gnome was born. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. It's, yeah. it's uh, in some ways a little bit of a letdown. There's not some kind of big brilliant plan behind it. It just happened. There's, there rarely is. There I rarely still to this is, day right? have never bought a gnome. Uh, they've all just shown up at different places in my house. <laughs> and. Uh, um, I, at this point, it's become a thing where I can't buy one because I never have, you know? <laughs> Mitch, we, we got an action item to give. Yeah, we got to get him a gnome. A, a fretboard gnome. <laughs> I'm writing it down right now. Fretboard gnome <laughs> needs to happen. That's right. Um, Every so, brewery. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so when did the love of craft beer start? I mean. Pretty early on. I mean, I, so I have to do the math. I, I think I'm 36. So <laughs> when, when I was in college, we had craft beer. We had we had Mount Carmel. Like it, it, we we had local beer versus some other people that had to come in in other ways because um, the, there just wasn't that didn't exist at one time. Whereas with me, it was always there. I was the weirdo that you know you're in college and I'm showing up to a party with a little cooler with you know growlers and Mount Carmel beer in it and sitting around drinking that instead of the natty light that everybody else was pouring. So you know, it was just it's always there. There wasn't there, there wasn't another choice to me. It's That's like where if you, you started. If, then, right? if you're going yeah. to drink. Drink. Well, you, you mentioned Mount Carmel, obviously, <laughs> one of Cincinnati's longest tenured breweries, sure, yeah. right? Have you always been like hyper local focused and Cincinnati yeah. in particular? Or, uh, yeah. are, you I know? mean, well, you know, when uh, are you did the drinking side or yeah. from the side of writing? Yeah. Um, drinking. drinking side, for the most part, I mean, at the beginning there, you know, especially when you first start getting into craft beer, you, you get excited to try what's new, you get excited to explore things and find that next thing for you. So at, th at that time, yeah, you're drinking everything. You know, once you get to, you know, 2000, what, 13 and beyond became a different story where all of a sudden you start to realize that there's enough happening here that you don't have to go other places right. to find yeah. something. You can't keep up with what's here. Okay. <laughs> I am also a uh, can collector. Okay. Um, when Mad Tree started canning their beers, I thought, oh, this is cool. Somebody local is, is doing cans. You know, this that's... I had pint glasses before that that got out of control. And I said, I, I'm, I'm gonna collect cans because 
there's only one brewery in town that's putting their, their beer in cans. There's only, you know, 10 breweries in town. I, I can do this, and it's not going to take up that much space. <laughs> takes up a lot of space now. And You're still <laughs> actively collecting cans? I'm trying. At one time, it was every now beer. Now with the aluminum shortage, that might be worth <laughs> maybe, something, Maybe, right? maybe. <laughs> Got a lot of money sitting in my yeah. basement. Um, so when, when did you start blogging? Have you had any journalism or writing experience? Or? No, I mean, when I was... Um, a teenager, I started a couple little blogs and stuff like that, just stuff that my friends were reading, nothing real. I don't know how it happened, really. I, I've always been like a, a note taker, kind of a geek about taking notes on stuff, and I um, was always kind of keeping track of what I was drinking and things about breweries. And, but, you know, there were was, there was some really great bloggers, but everything wasn't in one spot, and that drove me crazy, and I just started putting something somewhere, not really thinking anything of it. And then people started reading it, and then it was kind of this a moment of realizing, oh, this is, this is kind of fun to do this, and maybe I should, you know, put some more time into it, and yeah, yeah. I did. Well, how, how did you go from it, that, be, that realization that it was fun, to maybe that moment where you're like, you got some recognition, or, or, or you knew that. <laughs> I don't actually that, know that. Really? Um, it, it, it's there was just, no one there moment. There was no like, one oh, moment. Man, and there's, like, there are like those, those little moments, you know, I, um, when Sam Adams opened the tap room in, in uh, OTR, um, was it a year and a half ago maybe? Yeah, something like that. And I was down there and Jim Cook from, from Sam Adams was there and um, I went up and you know was talking to him for a minute and I said, oh, I've got this little local blog and I said, I didn't really know him. And he's like, oh yeah, I've, I've read your stuff. You know, when <laughs> we were you know, preparing for this, I, I saw some of the stuff you were writing and he rattled off a few articles that I had written and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, that's he's reading what I'm writing and like then you start oh my god like yeah anybody can read this stuff it's not somebody that's just hanging out in a tap room like anybody can pick up their computer or their phone and, and read this stuff and so there's moments like that where you start to see that it's a much bigger thing than just because really? with the brewery you, you make beer and then you walk in the tap room and you see people drinking your beer and laughing and enjoying this this thing you made it's it's so different when you're creating something that's lives in the digital world and yeah, you know yeah. the, that feedback is, is really no tangible yeah it's it's a it's a weird thing yeah, yeah. so do you have a, a favorite episode or podcast or events or <laughs> i mean what are what are kind of your big moments that you love to look back on and reflect and things of like that anytime we've been able to do a live event where people are there enjoying stuff with us is fun you know when I think that first year we were doing the, the podcast was our first uh, Christmas show. We called it the Holiday Extravaganza, and we, you know, for months ahead of time prepping, getting, you know, donations for raffles, and um, we lined up this this crazy lineup of people on the show. We were, we were every 15 minutes or probably less than that just rolling through different guests, and it just became, it was, it was chaos, and the show probably isn't that great to listen to, but... Um, it was just fun to have kind of that excitement of it and people there and people listening and, you know, meeting some of the people that listen to the show and, you know, getting breweries together, get that, that sense of community that we all love about craft beer. You see it happening around you and um, stuff like that's always fun. Yeah, you kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier, but obviously uh, our industry is rapidly changing oh and yeah. breweries opening and, and unfortunately because of a lot of the stuff going on, breweries closing. Um, you know the industry shifting. How how your evolution? You know, you started blogging and the podcast, mm -hmm. and now you're doing some live things. I mean, how how is the industry kind of shaping what you do, and how how are you keeping up with it? Right. I don't know if the industry changing is shaping what I do as much as it's solidifying the things that I want to do or the things that are in my head. It's like you know, from day one, even having a blog is kind of a silly idea. Writing about bunch of businesses that have successful social media, have great websites. Have, well, I guess they didn't have great websites at the time necessarily, but um, you know, having places that are capable of sharing this information with their fans. I'm not telling anybody anything that you guys can't tell them yourselves, but as things grow and as things get more complicated, finding one place where it can all come together becomes more important. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's not that it's shaping what I do as much as it is, it's confirming everything in my head and this vision in my head of what it is. Well, and it's extremely valuable to the consumer because they want an unbiased voice as well. For, well of course, we're gonna say. But I'm, I'm, I'm also, yeah. I'm not unbiased. Like, don't get me, yeah. like there are places that I like more than others. There's places that I write about more frequently because I enjoy going there. It's closer to me or things like that. There is definitely bias right. in what I do. If somebody that I like puts a beer in front of me and says, try this, 
it's going to taste different than somebody I don't like putting a beer in front of me and me trying it. And that's a, that's a, that's a real thing and something that I, I, I think people should understand the value of, too. Like, if you like a place, the beer tastes better. So your web presence, do you uh, any any updates to the website coming along or? Constant updates to the website. There's some things that have been working on for a really long time that you can't really see. Um, stuff that's getting built out kind of behind the scenes of growing the what the Gnarly Gnome is, I think. Uh, the idea that has always kind of been there that is getting closer to being uh, visible is that the Gnarly Gnome is just the source for everything drinking in Cincinnati. I'm a, I'm a drinker. I, it's not just beer. It's anything I can get my hands on, really. <laughs> but creating that place for anybody that wants to know anything about drinking, it'll all be on the thegnarlygnome.com. Um, there are obviously some different podcasts and some different shows and stuff on there that will guide you towards different parts of that drinking experience. From what we understand, you have a Hofbrau House story. That's I have a little bit of a Hofbrau House that's, story. That's worth hearing. Um, so probably three years ago, I had this idea that nobody had done and I don't think anybody can do again. And knowing that I was catching it right at that right time, I had to do it. I was going to go to every single Cincinnati brewery in one day. It's going to have a beer at every brewery in one day. Great idea, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it worked out fine. Uh, really hard to kind of figure out the, uh, the uh, you know, we had, I had three, four drivers, I think, throughout the day that kind of rotated so that one person didn't have to drive for, I think it was like 16 hours, something yeah. like that, to, to, to figure out that schedule of where do you go, how do you, how do you, how do you route around, get efficiently there. get yeah. to Ever? Because we're talking, um, at the time, I think the furthest east was Old Firehouse, to Great Crescent, um, to Fig Leaf, um, for the south would be what, like um, Party Town for Mash Cult maybe. Within that, you know, figuring that route out was difficult and coordinating drivers to be here at the right time. Getting a driver that's not gonna walk in, well, oh, let's just hang out for a minute. It's like, oh my God, well, yeah. I'm a minute, <laughs> you know. <laughs> the part that I didn't anticipate, so. Middle of the day, we got pretty far behind schedule because um, you walk in and you start talking to somebody and it slows you down. We picked it back up by the end of the night and by the very end of the night, we had a handful of stops left and um, we were ahead of schedule. I mean, this is great. You know, we can kind of slow down a little bit. We can enjoy ourselves. We can just kind of finish this up, you know, in you know, a little more relaxing way. And uh, I had a guy with me that was doing some video stuff that he was parked in northern Kentucky. Our original schedule had us ending at Rheingeist because they're one of the places that's open the latest. We flip-flopped that around a little bit so that we could end um, in Newport where his car was parked. We, we end up, we walk into, I think Hofbrau House closes at uh, 2, I think, officially. We walk in at 1.30. Like, this is great, we got a half hour. And we, and we go to the front door and there's nobody there and the lights are off. I'm like, oh shit, I'm like how, how What's, what did we miss here? So we start walking back around the corner. My, uh, my mom, by the way, was the uh, my last driver of the night, and she was parked around the corner waiting for us. And we walk down this the, the sidewalk and go in the beer garden, and there's beer gardens full of people, and they're drinking, and they're having I'm like, oh, that's, that's fine. They're still open. And I walk up to the bar, and I say, hi. I don't need a big beer. I just need just a little, little sample of something. It's a little taster. Um, and I kind of told him what I was doing and everything. And I said, hey, it's the last stop of the night. Every every brewery in Cincinnati has never been done before. And he's like, oh, man, I'm sorry. Uh, last call was five minutes ago. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding? Like, like, you burn here, my guy. last stop. He's like, yeah, I can't serve you. Last call was five minutes ago. And I said, you can't even serve me a little thing. I'm like, that guy's got two liters of beer and one in each hand. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I guarantee I'm going to be out here before. <laughs> He's like, no, I can't do it. And so I'm like, all right. We walk over and we sit down. I'm like, what do we do? What do we do? How do we, how do we figure this out? Do we just call it a loss and we made it to almost every brewery in one day? Or do we try to make a couple phone calls and try to get something to happen here? And couldn't figure out who I could call. Couldn't figure anything out. <laughs> I'm like, all right, that's, that's fine. You know, we, we made it here. We made it to every brewery in one day. And we, um, we get up and we leave and we start walking down the side of the beer garden to go to our waiting car. And as we're walking down the side of the beer garden, there's a couple sitting on one of the tables by the fence there. And I'm like, hey, what's going on? And I said, well, let me tell you a tale of what my day has been like. And I, I told him kind of what we were doing and everything. And he's like, well, he's like, man, I got half a beer left. He's like, if I drink it down to here, like, there's probably some backwash on there, but you can have that little last bit. And then you had a beer here. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, that's brilliant. 
It's not brilliant. Mistake number two. You don't ever <laughs> say that out loud. Uh, Hofbrau House has a couple police officers that just hang out in the beer garden because it gets a little rowdy there sometimes. The bartender sent them over and kind of pointed us, and they you know come over the table. And the guy that we're talking to, he's like, "Man, the cops are coming over." I'm like that's okay. Like we you know we're not doing anything wrong. He's like, "I'm not going to drink your beer because obviously we can't, and definitely we can't now." <laughs> and I said, "That's fine." And the cops came over and they said, what are you guys doing? And I said, oh, we're just, you know, we're talking to them. And I kind of told them what I was doing and everything. And he's like, well, you guys need to leave. And I said, well, we did leave. You know, we're on the sidewalk. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not in Hofbrau House anymore. <laughs> and he's like, no, you need to leave from the sidewalk. And I said, all right. Here's mistake number two, by the way. This would be three. Mistake number three. Two B. So you can't really make me leave the sidewalk because it's you know public property and I'm not impeding anybody's traffic or anything like that. I'm just having a conversation with somebody. Yeah, that was a mistake. No, big mistake. That was, that was a big <laughs> yeah, mistake. Don't do that. And he said, well, I'm, I'm going to give you the count of three to go. And my buddy's like, a count of three to what? And he's like, three, two, one. And he grabbed me and put me in handcuffs <laughs> and, <laughs> and took me to jail. However, the part that, that got me was that on the police report, they lied and said that I had been kicked out of Hofbrau House and um, a bunch of stuff that just wasn't true. Um, followed up um, then the next day, once I wrote the, the article about my big day of drinking and kind of explained what happened at the end of the night, there was a little bit of a uh, hubbub on social media about it and I think Hofbrau House kind of caught some, uh, um, some flack from people on there. Not from me, but from people. Yes, I was arrested, at Hof I was arrested in front of Hofbrau House <laughs> after Drinking at every single Cincinnati brewery. So in how many one day. how many breweries were there at that particular? <laughs> I should have this number memorized. I think it was like thirty, wow. thirty six wow. maybe something like that. Wow. Now that's counting like so at the time you had fifty West with two locations across the street from each sure, other. Sure, sure. I went to both locations though. I drank at Production Works and then I went across the street and drank at the Brew Pub. Just a logistically, story, it's impressive. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> hey, well, and you know the. Uh, uh, the masochist in me wants to know if it's possible to do it again. I don't think it is, but... All right. Well, let's take a brief break to refill our beers and to, uh, to that. tell you guys what's coming up this week in the tap room. We'll get out of your happy beer zone mm. and go to one of Fretboard's happy places, which is music. So, what was playing in the house growing up? What did what, you listen to? <laughs> Did you ever play an instrument? Yeah, I, I play a few instruments. Oh, I awesome. um, So, in the house growing up, one side, my mom was a big fan of the Doobie Brothers and the Eagles and Michael Bolton. So, there's that. There you go. All right, nice. Whatever. Why not? <laughs> And then you got my dad, and I things I remember from my dad playing 100% uh, John Denver. Uh, he had a Bronco, and so I said we were living in West Virginia at the time, and so you know just running through the mountains with John Ven Denver cranking out of the Bronco. <laughs> that's that's my memories of what he was playing. As far as instruments, yeah, I play a lot of instruments. I um, anything I can get my hands on to try to fiddle with, I will. But guitar, I, I think everybody plays guitar now, right? Play a lot of guitar. I have a little family band. We haven't got together in a long time because again kids but <laughs> it's my brother-in-law my father-in-law we we get together whenever we can and play music and write songs and hang out the the gnarly gnome tavern has a stage um, nice nice i'll send you guys a picture maybe you'll be right yeah here. you should um, <laughs> uh, do you want to ask your favorite question this is, or this do you is want my this is my Th favorite this question, is mitch's right? baby so i'll let mitch <laughs> yeah mitch so continue. if you were stranded on an island with one brewery's full portfolio of beers and one musician or band's full discography who would you choose this is difficult. I mean, fretboard, obviously, for the <laughs> beer. Um, if I can't pick fretboard, because I probably shouldn't pick fretboard, because I'm at fretboard, um, I might go with somebody like, um, maybe like Alexandria, somebody that uh, mm. that has some really good traditional stuff, but that uh, can go off on a weird tangent sometimes, too. I like uh, the things that Andy's doing down there. Street side, off street side. You guys can't see, but I'm wearing my street side Demogorgon underwear today. <laughs> I wear them uh, for luck sometimes. Um, yeah, there's, uh, really, you can pick almost any place in the city, and I would be happy with being stranded with their beer. Yeah. <laughs> Um, except maybe Hall for a house. Is that one? <laughs> even that's <laughs> even that's not true. No, yeah. they don't have like a wide enough portfolio though either that it would be uh, um, as fulfilling. But 
Um, I don't have an issue with Hofbrauhaus right, or their we beer. Love <laughs> Just I'm not going to say I love them, but um, we'll see when I can get the uh, the lifetime ban lifted. Uh, <laughs> you you got slapped with a lifetime ban? <laughs> Officially, yeah. The, oh, the city of Newport wow, Police wow. Department um, has banned me from every Hofbrauhaus. I don't know how that happens <laughs> or how you can do that, but yeah, no. Technically, I can't go to Germany and go to Hofbrauhaus because Newport Police Department says I can. Free I, the gnome. As far as uh. A band, their entire. Um, <coughs> I might go Fleetwood Mac. Nice. There's nice. a good range of music there, different yeah. styles that they kind of wrapped into stuff. Um, some good emotions, depending on how you're feeling on your island. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They are the most listed band by people when I ask this question. Really? Well, not necessarily this question, but one of the, the ne one of the next questions we're going to ask. Right. But uh, I listed them and. Tiffany, one of our bartenders, love them. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you're invited to karaoke death match, right? Okay. Um, mm -hmm. You get, you have to sing one song. One song. And nail ninety plus percent of all the lyrics. Okay. What song? What song's gonna bring it home for you? See, it's hard because it's karaoke, so you need to please the crowd too. I think I'm gonna go Britney Spears, baby, one more time. Oh, <laughs> oh I like it. Um, I, like I think it. I could get the lyrics, and um, I think it would bring the house down. <laughs> that's amazing. That's, would that's, you guys like that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> I, I would not have guessed that, man. So I gave you that question, and knowing that you were going to have time to think about it, one, I wasn't expecting that, but two, I was I was expecting maybe you would come up with something that was like so simple in its lyrics, just so you could survive, and it wouldn't be like you know you would you would. That's like the perfect middle ground. There's enough lyrics in that song that I most think people I probably it. wouldn't know, but it's. it's I've never tried, but I think I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> Put a lot of thought into that one, actually. Uh, I love it. I love it. Well, you, you of course would have to to dress up and dance. The oh, of course, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. usually, yeah. like on the weekends, that's normally kind of my outfit. You can wear your street yeah. side, right. get up there. <laughs> Oh man! So if you if you could classify the Cincinnati beer scene as a genre of music, what do you what do you think we're what we're doing here? This was much harder. So first, you know, I wanted to go. I, I when I look at Cincinnati's beer scene, um, scrappy. We've got a little bit of a chip on our shoulder because we don't get the respect we deserve. Um, there's a lot of kind of refinement behind what's what's going on, but we don't really display that in the way that some other cities do. Like I said, I struggled with it. I wanted to go like, you know, like pop punk or something like that. You got that dirt, but you've got this beautiful melody over time. And it didn't quite capture the um, the the feeling that I, that I thought it did. So I um, I'll go like a like an Americana punk rock, like 500 miles to Memphis, something like okay. that. You know, it's kind of yeah. that, that mixture between the two. Yep. So what what three bands then to put on mm. the fretboard stage? Dead or alive. Dead this, or alive. This was much easier. Or not. This was much easier for me. The first three bands that popped into my head from growing up and being into music. Some of the most fun bands that I've ever seen on stage. And it'll give you a very good insight on the type of music I was into as a teenager. But um, Aquabats, Real Big Fish, and Goldfinger. Nice. Some of my all-time favorite bands, and putting the three of them on the same bill, what I think would be uh, pretty incredible. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, wrapping up episode eleven. Subscribe to All Things Gnarly Gnome. Social media. Go to the website. Plug in. All good stuff. Uh, tune in next week, episode twelve. We're gonna have Fifty West Scott LaFollette on. Uh, yeah, it should be a really good show. So we appreciate everybody's time, and thanks for viewing Fretboard TV. And thank you, them for coming out. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. Look at your tiny beer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put my pinky out. Thanks, Teresa. <laughs>